The Will to Believe by William James, 1842-1910, a work in Ethics on the Philosophy of Religion, first published in 1897. The principal ideas of The Will to Believe are Decisions between hypotheses proposed to our belief are genuine options when they are living, of vital concern to us, or forced, no third alternative is possible, or momentous, presenting a unique opportunity of considerable Importance. Whenever a genuine option cannot be settled on intellectual grounds, it is right and necessary to settle it according to our passional inclinations. The religious option concerning the belief in God is a genuine option which promises most to the person who has the passional need to take the world religiously. Men possess free wills which are not determined. Determinism, the theory that decisions are causally determined, fails to account for the sense of human freedom. Now this work is something of a classic which takes its title from the first uh, ten separate essays written at different times. Originally presented as lectures to academic clubs, these essays express a tolerably definite philosophical attitude which James James named radical empiricism, an ordinary man's empiricism which takes experience as, it's, as it comes, seeing even matters of fact as subject to possible future reinterpretations. Yet radical for its rejection of dramatic dogmatic monism in the face of the obvious plurality of the things making up the universe. James also wanted to make a case for the right of men and women to believe in some moral and religious postulates for whose certainty the evidence can never fully be on hand. Sympathetic to a wide range of philosophical viewpoints, James sought to give intellectual significance to the role of the emotions in specified contexts. He also criticised the prevailing academic opinion that only scientific methods can produce an adequate understanding of the human condition. The first four essays, The Will to Believe, is life worth living? The sentiment of rationality and reflex action and theism are concerned directly with religious problems. Two others, the dilemma of determinism and the moral philosopher and the moral life, also give some attention to religious aspects of ethical problems. A final essay, What Psychical Research Has Accomplished, defends scholars who inquire into the possibility that mental life may involve phenomena which escape our ordinary scientific criteria. The remaining essays, Great Men and Their Environment and the Importance of individuals and on some Hegelisms 
show James concern to find common sense facts philosophically interesting, to criticize some unexamined assumptions of rationalism, and to resist the spread of absolutist and totalist theories which swallow up the individual in an environment, overlook human differences by stressing only similarities, and ignore diversity in emphasizing unity. Three types, three broad types of subject matter receive treatment in James's book. These are the nature and motives of philosophizing, the justification of religious and moral beliefs, and the nature of the moral enterprise. A common theme also runs through what would otherwise be a collection of unrelated essays. This theme is the problem of the relation of evidence to specific human beliefs. If the book has a positive thesis, it is that men may rightfully hold certain religious, moral and metaphysical beliefs, even when conclusive evidence for their apt adequacy is absent. James resists the positivistic tendency of his age to assume that scientific methods will prove able to decide all important questions about existence. Similarly, he expresses criticism of any rational, of any extreme rationalistic reliance on logic as the sole criterion of philosophical adequacy. There are some beliefs which are truths in the making. And I quote, And often enough our faith beforehand in an uncertified result is the only thing that makes the result come true. End quote. One comes to understand that James is moved to philosophical activity by a desire to justify the rightness of certain beliefs, that God exists, that men possess free will, that moral effort represents a genuinely objective worthiness, that pain and evil cannot justify suicide, and that practical as well as theoretical needs ought to influence one's philosophical outlook. The book's historical influence partly stems from the nature of the problems addressed by the author. Most of these problems are close to ordinary human experience. James also reassures those thinkers who, unconvinced that a completed metaphysical system is really possible, want to resist making a forced choice between philosophical certainty and philosophical scepticism. Philosophical argument can take place fruitfully somewhere on this side of certainty, according to James, yet such argument need not lapse into arbitrariness. Logic is a subservient instrument. It is subject to the felt need of religious, moral and practical demands. James argues that a qualified moral idealism need not lead to sentimentalism in escaping the twin threats of pessimism and nihilism. Some philosophical viewpoints are relatively more adequate than others, even though no one viewpoint can hope to exhaust the whole domain of reality. Such a genuine spirit animates James's essays that even critics who are unpersuaded by some of the arguments nevertheless recognize in them the evidence of a rare and gifted philosophical mind. The book's opening essay is crucial for the broad way it sketches the nature, purposes and possibility, possibilities of philosophizing. Written in 1879, the sentiment of rationality states convictions which are pre presupposed in James's more restricted discussions of topics 
in religious and moral philosophy. A number of basic questions caused James to write this essay. What is the philosophic quest really about? What are the conditions which any philosophy must meet if it is to be accepted? How can, how can one know that the philosophic demand for a peculiar kind of rationality has been satisfactorily met? Philosophic pursuit of, the, of a rational conception of existence, marked by universality and extensiveness, succeeds whenever a feeling of intellectual ease, peace, rest, is the result. Any adequate philosophy must satisfy two kinds of human desires. Sorry, I misread my notes there. I'll do it again. Any adequate philosophy must satisfy two kinds of human distress. Well, desires as well, I suppose. One is theoretical. The intellectual concern to form a general conception of the universe. And the other is practical the moral and religious desire to include men's passional natures in any philosophical consideration of how men are to act and what they should believe. Two cravings gnaw at the philosopher. Intellectual simplification is always one philosophical need. Simplification requires reduction of the world's numerous details to fewer significant abstractions which stress similarities. Theoretical life would be an impossibility without such abstractions. The other need is the clear demand for recognition of the perceived differences among things. Philosophic rationality results only when each of these competing impulses receives consider serious consideration. James insists that philosoph philo philosophizing involves a continuous, yet never fully successful, synthesizing of these two cravings, a mark of whose successful handling is the feeling that some original punish Puzzlement no longer proves irritating to the mind. As an activity, philosophizing must involve the whole man. Philosophizing must therefore often give way to hosts of other intellectual quests, since its own unique function is to discover a general picture of the hang of things. An important conviction operates at this point in James' development. It is that any metaphysical conception must remain open to future possible theoretical anxiety. Man's need of a philosophic view of na the nature of things results only in partial and temporary satisfaction. Any instance of the feeling of rationality can itself founder on the shoals of the question about its justifiability. Even if the world is a certain way, it might yet be otherwise. Thus the worry about non-entity arises, named by James, and I quote, the parent of the philosophic craving in its subtlest and profoundest sense. Through awareness of a possible other state of affairs, men can lose the feeling of rationality once gained. 
No single logical consistent system can still man's theoretical demands. When he is faced by the query, why just this sort of world and no other? And I quote, Every generation will produce its Job, its Hamlet, its Faust, or its Sartor, Rizatus. End quote. Mystical ecstasy can realize the psychological equivalent of the feeling of rationality when logic proves inadequate. And yet, and I quote, mystical ecstasy can realize the psychological equivalent of the feeling of rationality when logic proves inadequate, as I said. I think I've just repeated myself. This is the quote. Empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. Yet, that's the end quote. Empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. Oh, it's a dark and stormy night here. The wind is blowing outside. I'm trying to concentrate. Just a moment. Where was I? Empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy, end quote. For even the mysteriousness of existence depends on an irreducible fact about a universe which is dissatisfying to our theoretical demands. Exclusive concern with the theoretical impulse leads men to scepticism or to a sense of wonder about the universe. On the one or the other arises when a completed metaphysical system begins to wane. Does the matter end here? Denying that it does, James argues that now the practical life acquires a heightened rational significance. Practical demands play a role in one's choice of a philosophy when systems exist whose logical methods are equally sound. Men's belief that their wills can influence the future must receive justification in any important philosophical system. Men can adopt that philosophy which most fully satisfies certain moral and aesthetic requirements of human nature. The better philosophy is always relevant to men's expectations about the future. Yet there is no one final better philosophy. For example, a philosophy which retains the notion of substance will remain a perennial contender for human acceptance. Similarly, idealism will remain a challenging possibility for thinkers requiring an identification of the universe with our personal selves, materialism for thinkers, thinkers wanting an escape from selves, and James concludes that temperamental differences are important in the quest after the sentimental, after the sentiment of rationality. To be humanly acceptable, a philosophy must limit moral scepticism and satisfies men, men's belief that they count in the creation of a future world. 
According to James, no philosophy can succeed which ignores the practical craving after a world which is partly responsive to men's future expectations, their human faiths, and their common sense conviction that moral striving generally counts for something. I will end it there for now. In part two, I will take up the question, does God exist?